Um, so, um, thanks everyone for joining um, the Safe and Efficient Circuit Breaker Timing with Dual Ground Technology webinar. Um, my name is Lisa Newman and I'll be sort of technically hosting and moderating the webinar. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few bits with you before I hand over to Robert and Niels for the presentation. Um, so I'll just do a quick introduction to Robert and Niels. Um, Robert will be taking the main presentation today. Um, he started um, after graduation as a field service engineer for ABB um, and has been with MEGA since uh, 2008 um, as applications engineer specialising in high voltage circuit breaker and transformer test equipment. So he's uh, very experienced and knowledgeable. Um, and we also have Neil who is available for questions at the end. Um, and uh, he's been with MEGA since 1984 as a product manager for high voltage circuit breaker test equipment. Um, he's also got two patents filed as co-inventor for active interference suppression and resistance measurement on high voltage circuit breakers. Um, so, yeah, we're very lucky to have these two available today to uh, answer a lot of questions and um, give you some knowledge on uh, the dual ground technology. Um, so next, I'll just give you a little bit of background about MEGA. Um, so we've been in the electrical testing in industry for over 100 years, and we're focused on three, um, sorry, six different application segments. Um, as well as circuit breaker, we're also within um, the cable fault location, test and diagnostics, low voltage installations, single and three phase relay protection, transformer testing, and um, what we like to call general um, electrical testing, which is, includes insulation, battery, low resistance and power quality. Um, and we're proud to say that we're globally, we're either positioned uh, first or second in each of these segments. Um, so, next slide, please. So, I'm just going to go through some general housekeeping for the webinar before I hand over. So, you'll notice that you're all on mute, so um, please stay on mute because we want to avoid any background noise. Um, questions are very welcome, but please wait till the end of the presentation um, just so that it doesn't disrupt the flow of the presentation. Um, if you want to ask a question at the end, or if you have any technical issues throughout the, uh, the webinar, um, please use the chat function, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, if, you, if it's a technical question, send it just to me. I'm listed, if you select the drop-down list, I'm listed as the host. Um, and all questions you can send directly to me or to Neil or Robert at the end, um, and we'll read them out so that they can answer them and everyone can hear the answers. Um, yeah, as I say, any technical difficulties, um, contact me. And lastly, this presentation will be recorded so we can circulate to all, all attendees. So if you do need to drop off early or you want to refer back to anything, um, we'll have that as a resource for you. Um, so I think that's it from me. So I'll hand over to Robert now. All right. Thank you, Lisa. And, uh... I guess good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone since we're hitting multiple time zones here. Um, thank you for attending. So, uh, as said, this will be focusing on, on dual ground uh, timing of your high volt or medium and high voltage circuit breakers. So, just to give you a little bit of background, I will say that uh, dual ground basically is timing of a circuit breaker with both sides grounded. And uh, as I said, going to the background here, Mega released the first commercial DRM product uh, back in 1993. And then around 2006, we actually pioneered a, a new technology called the, the DCM method. And so now, uh, basically, there's, it's become an industry standard to go out there and, and time circuit breakers with both sides grounded if you can. So. Uh, I will talk about the reasons for uh, why you want to time a breaker with both sides grounded, and then I'll go into the differences between the old uh, dynamic resistance measurement or DRM technology and the new technology, the dynamic capacitance measurement that uh, Mager, of course, uh, invented and, and has the patent on. So, 
Uh, starting off, you know, you might, might ask, well, why do we want to test with dual grounds? Uh, first off, it, it can apply to the standards and, and local laws and regulations. Uh, one nice thing, if you're, it's, it's more efficient, so you can save some time, and it will require less work as well as you go through. And then, of course, uh, we can do it because it's possible, and most importantly, uh, you want to do this for your own safety. So, looking at the standards, if you look at IEC uh, 50110-1, it says, at the work location for all high and some low voltage installation, all parts that are to be worked on shall be earthed and short-circuited. And then, looking over at IEC 61230, uh, they actually talk about um, the, the rating of these earthing devices. And so, they shall be rated in terms of the short-circuit current, uh, and a time. And you'll see there, some of the most common times, three seconds, two seconds, down to about 100 milliseconds. And um, and this is more along the lines to, uh, you see these uh, grant or earthing connections that protect you a little bit from high voltage shocks and, and uh, capacitive coupled currents, but also uh, to help minimize if something happens like a, a switch closes in or there's accidental energization of the line. So you see here, um, it's to help minimize dangerous voltages in arcs in the event that the installation is accidentally switched on again or when an energy induced by energized adjacent installation is still present. And of course, most of you out there, if not all, have seen these, these different uh, earthing cables. And as you go through and you get to higher, um, uh, short circuit current ratings that can hold it for a longer period of time, you'll notice that these cables get uh, uh, thicker in, in diameter here. So they're more, um, let's say, hard to wield and, and hard to connect and everything. So it's a little more cumbersome to deal with these and to be attaching them and removing them and attaching and removing them uh, as you're performing timing measurements. So what are some of the hazards uh, that are associated uh, with uh, single grounded circuit breakers. For one thing, as I said, uh, and one of the most important here is the accidental re-energization re of an installation. If you're sitting there working on this equipment, and then if the the disconnect switch failed or or someone put something in that wasn't supposed to be there, now you ha you thought you were working safe, and of course it's it's energized. And this could go directly through you uh, if, if it's not uh, grounded on both sides. Uh, the other thing, you know, you try to avoid working in, in inclement weather conditions, but there's also, also the possibility of a lightning strike. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but you can have induced currents from nearby conductors, uh, transferring load current, and then capacity coupled currents. Uh, overhead lines and different things like that. And so you can have some electrocution, burns from the arcing, and then of course, if you do get shocked, and in, in, I, I know it happens out there, we all have gotten shocked out in the substation, but if you're not expecting it and hits you at the wrong time, you can have a secondary injury from falling off the ladder or, or the like. So let's first look here um, at a kind of a, a model of a of our substation here, or of, or of our uh, I, I'd say a capacity coupled circuit. So, looking at a 400 kV substation, you have this overhead line at 400 kV, and then we'll say the line's running for about 17 meters, and below that, about three meters below this overhead line, is, is where your circuit breaker is lying, um, and your disconnector switches and all that. And then uh, you'll say this the circuit breaker that that, uh, that bus line is probably about five meters above the ground. So, looking at the original overhead line compared to the bus there, you'll have uh, some capacitance around about a hundred picofarads in this example, and then also you're going to have some other stray capacitances between the bus and the ground at about 160 picofarads. So. 
looking through this and saying, okay, we have this 100 picofarad, picofarad stray capacitance and calculating through just using Ohm's law with 400 kV and a, a frequency of 50 hertz, you'll calculate it out to be about 13 milliamps of current uh, that can be generated uh, from this, this uh, stray capacitance there in this overhead line. Then going through and, and looking now at your, uh, your, your floating voltage, once this breaker is ungrounded on one side, you can go through and, and do a similar, similar calculations. And you end up saying that you can generate up to, uh, or actually have about 150 kV of potential between this, this floating open line on the bus there and the ground in, in the substation. So, looking at this example here, you can see that you have capacitively coupled currents that can reach double digit values in, in, in milliamps. And then now, not only that, the voltage potential that can push this current is actually gonna reach triple digit values in, in the kilovolt range. So, if you look at it uh, with this, this uh, this constant potential in there and this constant current, you really have a constant current generator uh, just due to these, these uh, overhead lines and, and capacitively capacit capacit coupled voltages and currents. So I, I will mention, of course, this, this depends on the system, but this is a, a model of a, a substation here that's pretty realistic of what you might find out there in a standard 400 kV substation. So, and of course, as I mentioned before, these shocks can be indirectly lethal uh, due to secondary falls. You can also get some burn injuries from arcing. So, looking at this in your standard uh, connection uh, of your test equipment, of course, the first thing that you always do when, when connecting test equipment is connect the ground of the test equipment uh, to, the, to the ground grid and then once that's connected, then you can start connecting up your lines uh, in, in your timing channels. Of course, when you do connect these, you wanna have both sides of the breaker grounded, go through, make all your connections, and then now you go through and you re remove your one side. And so once that circuit breaker is open, you can see that you have an induced current that's coming down and going uh, through the, the test equipment and down the ground. But if you're not paying attention or inadvertently one of these, uh, these timing leads get removed, now you can have an arc that's pushed by that 150 kV and it's pushing that 13 milliamps of current from our example here. And it, if you're not, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not very lucky, this current will pass directly through your body. So if you look at this, um, I, this is an example where if you accidentally pull out your timing leads without uh, grounding the circuit breaker or making sure at least that it's closed and grounded on one side, you can draw an arc and, and do some damage to your equipment or, or yourself really. And, and I've had a, I had a colleague in the past who actually went through and did a training and, and did ex like said exactly what I just said, make sure when you're uh, connecting your lines, everything's grounded, and then before you go through and disconnect your timing leads, make sure once again that everything's grounded. Well, he went through, said that exact thing, and then wasn't paying attention and actually pulled out one of the timing leads while the circuit breaker was ungrounded on one side, and he ended up drawing a, a large arc and shocking himself. And he, he told me that basically for the rest of that day, his arm was numb. So for several hours at least. So you, you know, a, a little mistake like that, not paying attention for a second can, can really catch you. And luckily he wasn't standing, you know, it was on the ground, he wasn't on a ladder or anything, so no falls occurred, but still it could have been a lot more lethal if he wasn't careful. So as I said, um, your, your typical test procedure, you know, your, your general site prep and everything but what you should do is make sure that you apply that ground to both sides of the breaker if you don't have this dual ground technology or you're not implementing it. And then 
you hook up all your test equipment, get your timing leads, transducers, everything hooked up. And before you start testing, now an authorized person needs to go in and remove the ground. At this point, you can start your testing. And then once all the testing's gone, remember before you start to remove your timing leads and anything up in the air there, you wanna make sure you reapply that ground to the other side so you're totally protected in removing it. And then once again, you can disconnect your test equipment and, and, and close down the site. Now, if you use dual ground technology, you can avoid uh, taking the extra time to do these steps and you're actually performing these safer because now you don't have to have one side of the breaker ungrounded and any current that would be going uh, through the test equipment because uh, when that breaker is open would actually now be going through the other side. So you can see you're always working in the safe zone between these two earthing connections on both sides of the circuit breaker, whether it's closed or open, you'll always be protected between those two. And of course, these once again, these these earthing connections are are not there to like be able to hold a continuous amount of current, but they're there to protect you in case there's an accidental energization. And so they'll protect you long enough to another circuit breaker down the line will trip out this current for you. So now we see why you wanna use uh, dual ground technology. So look, let's look first at some of the older technology called DRM or dynamic resistance measurements, and then we'll get into the, the dynamic capacitance measurements. So you've probably seen the, some presentations or papers on DRM measurements. And it's really primary function is to analyze the wear of your arcing contacts in your SF6 circuit breakers. But you can also use this for timing uh, with both sides grounded. But I'll, I'll mention there are some limitations to it, which I'll, I'll get into in just a minute. And then after we talk about that, uh, we'll go into dynamic capacitance measurements or DCM technology, which is the latest technology for timing contacts with both sides grounded. And this one works on both air insulated substation and gas insulated switch gear. And then it's also kind of a, a lighter and, and simpler solution uh, than your DRM technology. So uh, DRM itself is actually pretty simple. Everyone out there uh, should be familiar with uh, your ductor, your, your DLRO, micro-ohm measurements, uh, what, what have you, it's all basically the same thing. What you're doing is you're injecting a current, a, a DC current through your circuit breaker, and you're measuring the voltage drop. And from that, you, you calculate a resistance as you're going through. And now what we do is, that's like your, your stationary one or, or your, uh, your static resistance measurement. But for DRM, we're doing the same thing while we're operating the circuit breaker. So you'll be able to see it go from open to arcing contact to main contact. And then vice versa, when you're on the open, you'll go from main contact to arcing contact uh, to circuit breaker open. So let's examine uh, kind of the resistance you might occur or, or might see uh, in a ground loop here. So uh, a standard, air insulated uh, circuit breaker or, or switch gear in a, in a substation, you're gonna have your, your breaker up there and then you're gonna have your two earthing cables, say about 10 meters in length, 150 square millimeters in, in uh, area. And so now if we look at this and calculate the resistance, you'll see the resistivity times the length uh, divided by the area here, you'll get about 2.3 milliohms uh, for your ground loop resistance there. So, uh, and, and this is just an example here, but typical values you'll see is about the three to 10 milliohm range. And then now, if we look at your, your typical SF6 breaker, you're gonna have two different contacts in there. You're gonna have your, uh, your main contact. So this is the, the, what you're measuring when you do a micro-ohm type resistance. 
and you want to make sure this is as low as possible so you have uh, as minimal amount of losses and heating inside your circuit breaker. So when the circuit breaker is closed, the current's going to be flowing through this main contact, and you'll see resistance values from, I'd say, 30 microohms, uh, maybe up to 100 or, or 200 micro microohms, but we'll say 30 microohms in, in this instance. And then you'll have a, a uh, once you go from main contacts, they, as those separate, you go to an arcing contact. And then this is the current flowing through there is, is basically that arcing contact is designed to take this arc and slowly it will wear away, but it's designed to take the heat of that arc and, and not burn up. So you always have good contact on your main contact. And then the arcing contact is what wears away and takes the brunt of the operation when this uh, breaker is switching. And looking at this, you'll see that the, uh, the typical resistance value of a arcing contact can be anywhere from uh, 300 microohms up to 10 milliohms. So let's look at an equivalent circuit that you might have here. So when the circuit breaker is open, you're going to have basically your, your ground loop that, that we showed to be about 3 milliohms. And then now parallel to that, but not engaged because the circuit breaker is open, is your arcing contact, which can be, we'll say, 6 milliohms here, and then your main contact, which will be about 30 microohms. But this is your open circuit breaker, so all you see is that ground loop, which, of course, is 3 milliohms. Now, when we go through and that arcing contact closes, now the resistance is actually two parallel resistors. One is the, the ground loop, which is 3 milliohms, and one is that arcing contact, which is 6 milliohms. So you have your 3 parallel to your 6, so now you have 2 milliohms in that circuit. And then we go through, and finally that main contact comes close. And at this point, now you have uh, 3 parallel resistors. So you have your 3 uh, milliohms parallel to your 6 milliohms, parallel to your 30 microohms. So the overall resistance of the circuit then is 29.6 microohms here. So uh, looking at this, we're going to look at a, a, a typical DRM trace on a close and, and see what we're trying to time here and what the values are. So we go from your original ground loop, so your breaker is uh, is uh, um, open here, and we're going towards a close operation. So we go from a 3 milliohm, and then we go down to a 2 milliohm for a little bit of time. And if any of you have done uh, any kind of dynamic resistance measurements in the past, you'll note that, you know, it's a typical 4 to 7 millisecond of time uh, is, is when that arcing contact is engaged. And so now we have this little bit of span where we go from 3 milliohms down to 2 milliohms, and we're engaged in, for about 4 to 7 milliseconds in that 2 milliohms. And then at some point, the main contacts come in, and of course, we drop all the way down to 30 microohms. But you have this, uh, this uh, threshold in there uh, at 1,000 uh, microohms for this, this example here. And you'll notice that uh, I'll talk about in just a minute, but the closing time according to the standards is when those arcing contacts meet. But if you don't have your threshold set correctly, you might be measuring your closing time at the end of this, not when the arcing contact comes in, but actually when the main contacts come in. And so you can have this big discrepancy between what you've traditionally been measuring and, and what you measure with the DRM method. So to illustrate this, I'm going to show uh, one phase of a, 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 a live tank SS6 breaker that has two breaks per phase here. So on the top, you'll see that we have uh, the resistance of A phase, your first break, and it's about 5,000 uh, microohms per division on here. 
and then you'll see where the, the current trace there is our zero reference. So on the top is, is our break one of our A phase, and then on the bottom is our break two of an A phase, uh, of our A phase here. And now looking at this, uh, a typical threshold one might use for DRM timing is around five milliohms. So looking at the top one, you'll see the first touch occurs uh, right here around about 60, 64 and a half milliseconds, it drops below that five milliohms. So that's where it would record your first touch on break one of the A phase of this circuit breaker. But then if you go down and you look at, at break two here, you'll see that that first big dip is actually when your, your arcing contacts first touch there, but it doesn't quite go below that uh, five uh, milliohms there. So you actually don't register that. And if you look, it goes all the way up to about 66.6 uh, .6 or, um, or so on the, uh, in time before it actually drops below that uh, five milliohm uh, threshold that we have set there. So you actually see a two millisecond difference between break one and break two, when in reality they, they almost closed in right on top of each other. And of course, according to IEC 62271-100, you'll notice that the max differences between a phase should be about two milliseconds there. So you might think something's wrong with the circuit breaker, even though it's actually closing right in, if you're just relying on your typical threshold that you had set in your machine and weren't, weren't looking directly at the traces. And you'll notice I, I keep talking about uh, arcing contacts and different things like this, and we're getting this out of both the IEEE and NIEC standards. So if you look at the IEEE C37100, which is all the, the definition, you'll see that for closing time, it's the interval of time between the initiation of the closing operation and the instant when metallic continuity is established in all poles. And then on the open side, this is now the interval of time between the time when the actuating quantity of the release circuit reaches the operating value. So basically once your coil's energized there, and the instant when the primary arcing contacts have parted. So not the, not the main contacts, but the actual arcing contacts. So kind of your, fir your first metal on metal and last metal on metal touch here. Um, and so that's from, from IEEE C37.100. And then similarly, on IEC's uh, definitions in the 62271-100, you'll see that closing time is the interval of time between energizing the closing circuit, uh, the circuit breaker being in the open position in the instant when the contacts touch in all poles. And then looking at your opening time uh, for a circuit breaker trip, by any form of aux power, the opening time is the interval of time between the instant of energi energizing the opening release, the circuit breaker being in the closed position, and the instant when the arcing contacts have separated in all poles. So for with your traditional timing, what you've always been timing in the past is when these arcing contacts are touching and when these arcing contacts are separating. So in order to, to make sure you're continually uh, testing compared to, like, uh, compared to your previous results, you wanna make sure that you're always uh, doing the same thing and have these thresholds set correctly if you are using DRM technology. So our previous example here was a air insulated switch here, but now let's look at uh, GIS where now you don't have these these milliohm grounds, you actually have grounds in the microohm. Everything in this in this switch gear is grounded here. It's all very good grounding circuit. So now we have your uh, resistance of your circuit breaker uh, being uh, basically uh, uh, 150 microohms going through the breaker. But then now, as I said, the resistance of your ground circuit is even less at 75 microohms. So you look through here and you'll see that uh, when the circuit breaker is in the closed position, 
you now have uh, 75 microohms parallel to 150 microohms. They actually have a, a 50 microohm circuit here. And then when the, uh, the, the arcing contact, which we're trying to measure during our timing, uh, it, it is closed. Then you have actually two milliohms parallel to 75 microohms. So you have 72 microohms in this equivalent circuit. And then once the circuit breaker is open, you're just looking at the, the ground circuit and you'll see that the, the actual value is 75 microohms. So now we only have a three microohm margin that we're looking for when look at, looking between our closing and opening of our circuit breaker, because once again, we're timing those arcing contacts. So, as I said, we went through a DRM, which is dynamic resistance measurements. And one of the main pitfalls of this is trying to find that threshold. And you want to make sure that that threshold uh, is, is lower than the ground loop resistance, but you really don't know this ground loop in, until like after you start your testing. So you might, this might be an iterative, iterative process going through trying to uh, detect this, this threshold that you, should, you need. And then of course that threshold also has to be higher uh, than the ground loop being parallel to the arcing contact. And once again, these are unknown parameters when you first start testing. And on top of that, you can also have uh, these magnetically in induced current that is superimposed uh, on your test current. And so now for half cycle, it's contributing, and for the other half, it, it's, uh, it's, um, it's working against it. So you can, it's, uh, and it could be up to or close to the value of your actual test current here. And once again, this is an unknown value unless you go out there with the actual clamp on CT and measure what these actual magnetically induced currents can be. And they're not very easy to filter out um, because now if you did put this filter in, it put, uh, imposed a time delay on your, your circuit or on your timing. And of course, what, the main thing we are trying to do is to make sure that this thing is timed correctly and you, you're timing this in milliseconds and you want to have at least mic some kind of resolution in the microsecond. So I, I just went through DRM and, and, and how it's used in, in some of the pitfalls. So is there a better solution to timing a breaker with both sides grounded? So this is where DCM technology or dynamic capacitance measurements come in. So now um, ground loop resistance arcing contact resistance and their relation to each other isn't important because DCM is actually looking at, at impedance, not just resistance, but impedance. And it's designed to catch both the, the closing and the opening of the arcing contact, not the main contact, but the arcing contact. And we do this by using a high frequency signal uh, that's a, a, at low currents, less than 100 milliamps. And we're looking at the resonance frequency of that circuit and, and we're looking at this, uh, sampling this uh, in the, at a very high frequency to, to see as it changes. And of course, it's uh, very reliable with very repeatable results once this circuit's tuned here. You don't have to adjust any thresholds. And one of the nice things is this is a, a nice, uh, simple, lightweight solution. So how does this DCM method work? What we're going to do is look at this typical uh, SF6 interrupter here. We have your stationary contact on the right and your moving contact on the left. And you'll see that the nozzle and the arcing contact in the center there. And then, of course, you, you have your main contacts in, in that, that ring going around. So think of this actually as, as two different uh, charged plates or whatever separated by a distance. So it, it's really a, a variable capacitor here. So we can apply capacitance and say, okay, we have this dielectric constant and we have an area separated by a distance. And of course, when the breaker's closed, these th this, this is shorted out. And then once those arcing contacts separate, you, you kind of have this large capacitance that's decreasing uh, as that uh, distance increases. 
And of course, there's also inductance in the system uh, from the cables, um, you know, and your test leads, conductors, all that kind of stuff. But the thing to remember is this resonating frequency is going to change uh, with the moving contact here. So if we look at this equivalent circuit down here, you'll see you have your circuit breaker, and then you have some inductances in the cables going around. And then, of course, you have your two grounds on the outside that have some resistance and inductance to them as well. And then we take this uh, DCM device, which is a variable frequency in the higher kilohertz uh, to, to the, the lower megahertz range, and we're putting this frequency on there. So we have a, a parallel resonance circuit, and we go through, and as I said, we, we look for resonance here, and we see where can we get a minimum current, and, and we lock onto that frequency. And this is, of course, the first thing we do is we, we have the breaker closed to find this frequency. Then, as we go through and operate the circuit breaker, we're taking, uh, you know, timing samples the entire time, and now, before the breaker was closed, as the breaker comes open, this resonance shifts because now we, we put a large capacitance into the system. And so that uh, frequency and that resonance point actually shifts over and we measure this difference in time and we see the breaker go from open to closed position or vice versa. So how is the, the DCM test equipment used? What's nice is we could actually take our, our TM1700 or TM1800 for, for what we're doing and, and just take the module and interface it with our, our traditional timing channels that we've been using. And then you have a, a cable here and we go from the, the DCM module up to the, our little tuner box and from there those cables split and actually go to your, your circuit breaker and connect just like normal timing leads. And here's an example with the DCM module right next to your, your timing module plugged in and the cables on the right there are going up towards your circuit breaker. So as I said, you just hook up these, these DCM uh, leads up to your, your bushings like you normally would on when you're doing traditional timing. But now the nice thing is you're working in the safe zone because these, these two disconnect switches open and then you have a ground on each side of that circuit breaker. So no matter what happens, if it's accidentally energized, lightning strike, it'll go through those grounds. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do we execute this, this timing measurement using DCM? So as I said, you just connect the test leads to the main contacts, just like you would in any kind of traditional timing method. But then you have to do one extra step here. Well, uh, one you have to make sure of one thing first is that the circuit breaker is in the closed position. Then once that circuit breaker is in the closed position, you have to determine this uh, resonance frequency. And by when I say determine, actually what you do is you just press the tune button real quick and release it, and the DCM will go through it and find this, this resonance circuit uh, between the, the circuit breaker and the ground here. And then at this point, you just measure timing like you would with your conventional timing device. So if you look at this, the only way this differs from tr traditional timing is that you must begin your, your timing measurements from the closed position. So close that breaker and then hit that tune button. And then from then on, it's just like any normal timing that, that you're used to performing. And what's nice is you don't even see a difference. You can compare your current result to your, to your older results if you were using one of like a traditional timing method. And you can still see your, your, your contact bounce and, of course, your, your, uh, your, your contact closes and opens just like any other timing device you've been using in the past, whether it's been grounded or ungrounded. And so looking at the, the timing results, you can see here for a, a standard open here on the DCM, 
you'll see that we got 47.7, 47.5, and 47.7 milliseconds for A, B, and C phase. And then with conventional timing, we remove one, one ground and, and perform the same timing, and now you get 47.6, 47.5, and 47.6 milliseconds. So essentially the same time, I would say the difference here of 0.1 milliseconds was really more due to the circuit breaker and its repeatability, um, but these overlay right over each other. And then if you look at the close time, now you'll see with the DCM, we got 56.4, 56.5, and 56.5 milliseconds for ABC. And then of course with conventional timing, same exact numbers, 56.4, 56.5, and 56.5 milliseconds. So comparing your DCM to your conventional timing, the same numbers you can see, we got bounced the same on, on, on the different phases. And you really can't tell from looking at, at the results which one was performed with, with uh, both sides grounded and which ones was performed with, with uh, one side ungrounded here. So, when we first went through and, and, and came up with this DCM technology and, and timing a breaker of both sides ground, it was really to make it safer for us out there in the substations. So that was our, our main motivation. But then uh, we found out, you know, through experience and, and doing some further testing, that there's actually some other benefits to dual ground timing with this DCM application. One of them, it has to do with your, your generator circuit breakers where a lot of work's involved in removing this direct connection from the generator to the circuit breaker. And then also with the uh, gas insulated switch gear, uh, removal of these fixed ground connections. We're able to go through and use this DCM technology with some additional accessories to make this timing uh, where traditional DRM would not work. So looking at a, a generator circuit breaker, as I said, uh, conventional timing requires that you remove these bus bars. So you see there's a, a lot of bolts in there uh, between to connect these, these flexible bus bars between the circuit breaker and the generator. So you disconnect all that, perform your timing, and then before you put this thing back in service, of course, you gotta reconnect that. You have to go through and torque each one of those bolts, and then someone else has to come through and, and check and verify that they torque that, that, that you torque that bolt at the correct value. So it's a very uh, labor and, and time intensive process here. So if you can avoid disconnecting those, it, it, it's great and, and a huge time saver. Uh, so this is a, a nice application of dual ground timing. So, excuse me. So now with traditional timing, uh, with or with traditional circuit breakers, I'll say your air insulated switch gear, you'll see that the the nice thing with DCM is that the ground loop is generally a lot larger and, and has more impedance than what's going on through the circuit breaker. So on this this left one here on the the dead tank circuit breaker, you'll see okay, the green is what your circuit breaker loop is, and the red is your ground loop. And then it's even better conditions on your live tank circuit breaker where you, you really just have, you're measuring right through that interrupter. You don't have these bushings and all that to go with it. So the, the uh, ground loop is much larger than your circuit breaker. But when we look at a, a, a GIS type of application, now you don't have that luxury of your, your ground being much larger and a, a lot larger impedance than your, than your circuit breaker. And in, in a lot of cases, it actually might be less impedance than what's going through your circuit breaker. So what can we do to alleviate this? So on traditional timing with this circuit, uh, what we would do is actually remove this grounding shunt here, and then one side of the breaker is grounded, one side's ungrounded, and we perform our, our traditional timing. And of course, um, at this point, if we go back to putting that shed on, that is where we want to make sure that everything's grounded. And of course, we're safe here uh, because we're working within uh, 
both uh, within both sides of the break are grounded. But as I said, removing that shunt with the circuit breaker in the open position, this is where we can get those those capacity couple voltages or, or and currents and everything, or of course accidental energization. We're at risk once again with having one of those sides ungrounded there. So what do we do with, with DCM technology? With that shunt on there to, to make sure that both sides are grounded, we can put something called a ferrite on there. And you've probably seen these on some kind of electronic devices. Uh, it's just like a little iron here. <coughs> Excuse me. And you'll see that the um, we put this on there and what this ferrite does as we hook the DCM cables up on both sides, and the ferrite is actually a high impedance uh, in the range of our of our DCM uh, tuning here. So in this this uh, high kilohertz to low megahertz frequency, this ferrite acts as an impedance. So now we we're hooked up really on both sides of the shunt here, so the cables are very close to each other. But now, that ferrite won't allow the DCM to tune through it. So it has to actually tune back and go all the way through the circuit breaker in order to complete its circuit. Even though these are physically connected right next to each other, if you were looking simply at uh, resistance values, it would go right through. But we're looking at impedance, and we have a, a large impedance in this frequency range of our DCM. And of course, if you have uh, any kind of um, connection rods, something going to the other phases, you'll have to put a ferrite on there. And of course, uh, if you have any kind of uh, cable or, or, or grounds coming in, you might have to put a ferrite here. So any kind of path that this DCM can tune through, you, you would need to put a ferrite to force it to tune through that circuit breaker. So a couple of things to look out for uh, when do, performing your timing here. One, this is a, a typical shunt here you might see, and you'll notice that uh, on, on one here, we have this insulated washer. So we apply our ferrite. So when we go through and we tune through that shunt, it goes down and it tries to go through that ferrite, but of course, because it's impedance at the frequency that we're, we're applying, it can't. But now, on the other hand, you can have a, a non-insulated washer. So as I said before, on the insulated, you'll see that it would try and tune through that uh, shunt, and we could block it with the ferrite. But now, if it's not an insulated washer on there, you have a direct bolt connection going down through. And even if we put a ferrite on that actual shunt there, it'll still tune uh, right, or it won't, it'll tune right through that bolt and the ferrite won't be of use to us. So what some people might do is actually pull this breaker out of service for a little bit and replace their, their typical washers with an insulated washer. And then they can put whatever they need to back in service and, and start timing with just the, uh, with the breaker grounded on both sides. So I, I mentioned these ferrites. And there's a variety of ferrets we have here in our kit, which is a, a C and an I type, and you can combine them to have two Cs or, or C and an I. And then, of course, we also have these ones that go over your cables. So looking at a, a typical, like, ELK type circuit breaker, you'll see that uh, you have your three phases coming out here, and then you have a central grounding point in the middle where those, those three uh, – bolts are. And so normally what you would do is when you need to time this, you'd you'd basically loosen these, these three bolts on the outside and then remove these three bolts here that's all connected to the grounding switch. And so now at that point you could go through and connect to each individual phase, but of course the breaker's not grounded on both sides anymore. And then here's an example of a shunt where you typically have this grounding shunt on there 
that you'd want to remove for your, your, your timing. But now if we go through using the DCM technology and applying these ferrites, you'll see that we have no longer do, do we unbolt any of these connections. You have your, your single grounding point here and you can see all three cables are connected to that grounding there. And then the individual phases, the other side of the cable is going to your A, B, and C phases here. So you see one here, uh, one on the left and one below that clip where, where all three are connected. And then you have a ferrite going, uh, blocking that signal. So it tries to tune from, from that center leg to, to one of the outside bolts, but, but that ferrite prevents it. So it actually has to go back all the way through the circuit breaker in, in order to complete that circuit. And then you get at your timing results, as I said, like your traditional results, uh, and, and you're not able to tell if, if I did this with DCM technology or traditional timing. Then uh, looking at some other attachments that you can have uh, with your CNI profiles on your ferrites here. Once again, you'll have your three different phases, A, B, and C there, and then your, your standard grounding connections. And so you'll apply ferrites over those uh, on each one. So blocking that path between each phase there and ground. And then of course, hooking up your clips there to the individual uh, phases and then to ground as well. And then once again, a different view here, you'll see the ferrites, of course, on the left there, and then a close in, you got your connection to that bolt on the individual phases. So any kind of path that you that you could possibly tune through, you'd want to put this ferrite there as an impedance on our, in our frequency range in order to, to push it back through the circuit breaker. And then here's just an example uh, of one of the ferrites on a, a standard grounding cable. And what some people have done too is the original GIS system might be designed with a shunt going across there. And so when they're able to pull it out uh, a service and maybe pull out an adjacent line and, and ground that if they need to, to be able to work on this one and then replace the traditional uh, shunt with maybe a cable here that has an easily attachable ferrite uh, going to it. So then we're able to go through and, and of course energize the other line and then still be protected with the grounds on both sides of this individual circuit breaker. So let's go through a, a bit of a summary here. Uh, DCM can, can easily be applied for, for main contact timing um, and it's really the, the only reliable method uh, to catch the closing and opening of your arc, arcing contacts per IEEE and IEC. And then uh, when testing GAS, uh, you, you still have to have this isolated ground switch, um, but you don't have to go through and remove all these fixed connections and, and linkages and all this. You can actually use these ferrites uh, in order to tune correctly. And really DCM is the only reliable method for dual ground timing on GIS. Um, as I said, these ferrites are, are needed to tune correctly and you need sufficient space uh, to attach these ferrites. But really, uh, once this is hooked up and it, you can go through and, and time this w with both sides grounded. And then you have to use this DCM technology where DRM technology would not work for your GIS. And of course, using this, uh, this dual ground technology works perform most importantly safer, but really faster and easier uh, because you don't have to go through all these like uh, on traditional air insulated switch gear, applying the ground, well, you still have to apply the grounds, but removing the ground, performing your timing, then reapplying. And then of course on GIS, or you don't have to remove all these different shunts and everything. And of course on those generator circuit breakers, it, it saves a, a lot of time uh, from removing that, that flexible bus bar there. So uh, just to go through, uh, that's pretty much the, the end of the, the informative session. I just wanna talk a little bit here about our, our TM17 and 1800 uh, circuit breaker analyzers 
which both have the, the DCM technology as an accessory to it. Of course, the 1700 is two breaks per phase or less, a gang operated or IPO circuit breakers. So any traditional circuit or any current circuit breaker almost coming out now. And then TM1800 really will test any circuit breaker out there uh, from oil circuit breakers, SF6, TAS, and of course your, your old air blast one. But both of these are equipped with DCM technology. Uh, for the 1800, you have your, your DCM module here. They both use the same type of uh, uh, cable that your frequency cables here. And then of course the DCM 1700 is for your TM 1700. And we have the accessories here like the ferrite kit to help uh, with tuning your, your GIS circuit breakers. And uh, I'm glad you guys attended this today. Uh, but please, you know, if you have more questions or if you want to look at other accessories that we have, of course, go to our website. You have our circuit breaker testing accessories. But more important than that, we have uh, multiple different application notes, uh, testing guides, and various how-to stuff with, within, our, uh, within our library uh, on Mager.com. And you're always free to, to contact us, contact your local salesperson, uh, your, your local technical support, and we can assist with any questions on connections and, and applications as well. At this point, uh, I think uh, we're, we're concluded with the presentation, uh, but we are now open for questions that, that both Nils and I can address. And uh, Lisa, if you want to help us out here on, uh, on the logistics on, on uh, how we're going to get these questions going towards us. Yeah, so if, um, if anyone wants to submit a question, if you use the chat function on the right-hand side, um, you can select it to, um, to just myself or to myself and Nils and Robert. Either way, I'll read out the questions when they come through. So um, we just give it a couple of minutes for people to send anything in. Nothing's coming through. Um, I mean, if, if anyone has questions um, following the the webinar, was sort of every, they've had to think about everything and things have gone in, and you think of any questions, is it okay to contact you directly, Robert and Niels? Right. Yes, for sure. Uh, you can contact me at uh, Robert Foster at mager.com, so R-O-B-E-R-T dot F-O-S-T-E-R at M-E-G-G-E-R dot com. So yeah, feel free to send me your questions directly. And then, uh, Nils, is there a standard uh, tech support?